My name's Martin Cross. I'd like to talk to you about the theory of everything and everyone. I'm a philosopher, not a scientist. Uh, I've got just a few minutes to talk to you about truth. This is intended to be an introduction to a series of six one-hour talks. Primarily, as we'll see, they're not talks on the subject I'm talking about at the moment. Let's, let's just make an introduction so that we're on the same page. Now, I'm not a scientist, I'm a philosopher. I'm not talking about proof, and I offer no proof, but I'm talking about truth, and I expect that people will recognise truth when they hear it, as they have done throughout the whole of time. So I'm not held back by the fact that I don't have and don't intend to have, don't want to have proof. I'm not a scientist and it's not important to prove what is true, at least to me. I'm going to tell you some things that you probably won't particularly want to hear. That's because I'm telling you what you need to know, not what you want to know. I hope that you'll find it enjoyable anyway, and I know you'll find it enlightening. As, as an example, the subject of this first introductory talk is destiny. Why would you want to know what I have to say about destiny? Well, that's a good question. You wouldn't want to know it necessarily. For example, one of the things I would say is if you're one of those people, and I've met a, a few of them, a handful of them in my life, who are more or less treading water until they win the lottery or, or the equivalent thereof, I would say then that somebody needs to talk to you sensibly about destiny because because the people with money the only people with money are the people who don't want it the people who have got money that want it are not going to be able to hold on to it so when you're thinking about um, your dreams coming true and your uh, buying that lottery, you're, you're paying one pound for that lottery ticket. I sum up my point of view in one sentence, and it's and it's a question. So ask yourself this question next time you're tempted to buy a lottery ticket. Would you prefer never to have won the lottery, or would you prefer to have won it but lost it all? Because not everybody can win the lottery. And although it may seem as if an unthinkably large amount of money would solve problems, it doesn't take a lot of thought to realise that actually it would, for most people, it would likely create problems that are not easily solved. I think in my own case, an unlimited amount of money, would it mean I could watch better films, read better books, listen to better music? eat better food? I don't think it would mean any of those things. It wouldn't make me a better dancer. It wouldn't make me better at sport. All the things that are important to me in enjoying my current life would not be helped by, I offer by no proof winning a hundred million. The and in fact it would be complicated. That there would be problems arising. And, and I think it's healthy is something to be told. We recognise that's a completely a false it. dream. What would Provided you do with a hundred million pounds? We well, I hope I would give it away it. or burn it. So there's a stronger argument in my I'm mind for burning the money than that there is for giving it away. Watch this will be perfectly happy to Although that make their own life feel strong about, about because it's they the have least the important interest. thing that and I could ever say to anybody. Um, about destiny. one of the things that success does so let's, is, it gives, is, is it takes away your own vested interest. Let's get to the, the meat of the material. The theory of everyone and everything occurred to me when I was 27, over half my life ago. 
the funny thing is, I knew almost immediately that it was that. Obviously, I knew I had a lot more thinking through to do. Essentially, the theory hasn't changed in all that time, but my understanding of it has, has developed. Now, I'm not saying that everybody agrees with my theory. I'm not even saying that anybody agrees with my theory. I'm only saying it's an interesting theory. So interesting that I wrote a complete book about it in order to think it through for myself. It's not a book that's been published to the general public, except in a free of charge form. So you can download a PDF of this. It's a full 100,000 pound. It's a full 100,000 words with uh, proper illustrations and you can download it free of charge from my website or, or go to my YouTube channel and download it from the first page there. So I published this to friends and family about 20 years ago and this series of lectures is me coming back to this and revisiting it with the wisdom of hindsight. So really something I'm very, very strongly motivated to do. Obviously, it would be great if you could read this in readiness for that, but it's not necessary. Of the crazy, foolish, weird things that I've put on record by the fact that they're in this book and haven't been changed to, to, for the last 20 years, probably the most, probably the single strangest thing is one of the, is, is, is one of the most recent ones, which is that the third dimension is relative, subjective. What do I mean by that? It's explained in the book because the idea hasn't changed. The three dimensions of internal space as well as external space. OK, let me start again. The world is infinite and so are you. What is the best approximation we have to that infinity is three dimensions. However, three dimensions of width, height and depth do not describe you. They don't describe your mind. They don't describe your ancestry. They don't describe the past. They don't describe, they don't even describe outside of the solar system. So it's an inadequate definition which leads one to seek a better definition. So the best definition that I've managed to come up with, the one that I was looking for and eventually found, was this. Three dimensions to describe infinity, but one of them is truth. And as it turns out, if you, want, if you see the videos on my website, there's a lot of meat to this idea, and it's, it's a meat that is accessible, beneficial, advantageous, outside of science. There's no proof for it, and never could be. What are the other two dimensions? Well, the other one was very obvious, immediately obvious, which is goodness. Goodness is just as important as truth. It's not more important, it's not less important, it's just as important. So it's a perfect candidate. You might have beauty, you might have kindness. I've discussed all of this when I was writing the book, so to me that's, that's old news. So goodness and truth are the first two dimensions. The third dimension is chance or fate. Again, it's completely different to the other two, 
but it's completely equal, neither better, neither worse, and in, of itself, neither good nor bad, neither true nor false. So these three dimensions turned out to be a very, very robust description. Now, as I thought this through over decades, I've had a, a, a question more exactly on which is the third dimension that is subjective, because this is a subjective dimension. This is not a subjective dimension. What is true, what is false, that is completely objective. Good, bad is completely subjective. It doesn't mean it's not real. On the contrary, it's just as real as truth and falseness. But it will never not be subjective. Chance and fate, well, that's really time, progress, purpose. So that's not really and that's not really subjective. It's much more, it's, it's as much objective as it is subjective. So when I say the third dimension is subjective, in this diagram it's a little bit, well, the second dimension is, is the subjective one. Why, why is that, why is that important? Well, our theory of everyone and everything needs to be a theory that applies externally as well as internally. Now, truth as an external dimension, you can sort of see how the three dimensions of external reality kind of extend inwards, because I'm not, um, I'm not a collection of uh, cells. I've got a soul, I've got a mind, I've got these abstract things. And when I die, I won't, I don't, I don't get switched off. I'm not like a computer. I don't get switched off and then forget everything that's happened in my whole life. Everything that's happened in my whole life when I die becomes a part of me. And we'll see how, we'll see how this is, this is beyond, this is not a theory. This is, these are facts that we use in our, in developing our understanding. We'll see that as we go, as we go forward. So for the moment, why is this important? Well, because it turns out we can ask a similar question of the external universe that we're asking about this abstract, non-physical space, which is We can see how uh, truth and possibly goodness are manifested externally and can continue internally to some abstract space. If we can, if we can, uh, if we can see the analogy there, then we can ask a similar question about about the third dimension of external space. Well, what aspect of that is, is, is relative? If I was to describe the shape of the universe, which I, <coughs> which I, which is part of a live talk, which I, so the third dimension is subjective, and we'll see how that applies to destiny, and also externally as well as internally. But before I, before I go into that, let me just quickly outline what the format of the next six talks, next five talks is going to be. So in order to come up with a complete theory of everybody and everything, not only are we trying to describe the entire universe, 
in a way that corrects the problems that there are at the moment. There's a difference between mind and brain. What we don't have is a definition of mind until now. We're going to be discussing then in the next, in the very next section, mind, and then having got ourselves on solid ground with that, we're going to move on to soul in the third of these talks. And then we come on to identity and what is the meaning of I? At the moment, an awful lot is ascribed to genes and clearly mind, soul, the idea that I continue after my own death and also <coughs> and also had an existence prior to my own life, that idea is not, is not uh, encompassed at the moment in a way that in a way that corresponds to common sense. So we're going to address the, the nub of what is the I? What do we mean by I? That automatically then leads on to the next question, which is what, which is about us. <coughs> An understanding of I enables, if, there, if such a thing was possible, enables an understanding of us. And so there's a, 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 a discussion to be had there. That's the fifth of these six talks. So the final talk comes full circle, having laid out, as it were, a framework or a map. It's time to move on, or in my case, move back. And so finally, we come back to me and the fact that this is not my main job. We're asking ourselves questions about destiny. I think there are two sorts of ways of viewing life in the abstract for everybody. The first is that, the, the commonplace one, that life is a journey. One starts it as an infant, one goes through the shared experiences almost all of us have, degree or qualification, some kind of trade marriage, children, old age, retirement, death. So life is a journey, a, a, a journey which is um, uh, different for everybody, but has the same start and end point for everybody. That's one paradigm. An alternative is that life is a, um, a mysterious sort of game where uh, there are levels of revealing so that um, at a certain level of understanding one sees a certain level of reality but then matrix style something can result in you stepping through a particular door or, or, or changing to a particularly particular alternative point of view and then suddenly you see a whole new level to reality that you that you never thought was there. I think it, <clears throat> I think that both journey and game are a, are a partial understanding of of destiny and I want to talk about um, destiny more in a, more in a concept of um, mental excellence than in a, in a concept of um, putting it into a box. Let me come back to my diagram. I. Let me come back to my diagram, truth, goodness and chance. Now, I suddenly realised one day 
a decade or so after, well, uh, I suddenly realised quite recently there was an aspect of this diagram that I hadn't fully understood. Let's, um, let's take an orthogonal view of three dimensions, by which I mean let's draw it in a slightly different way. So we'll still have a vertical, we'll still have a vertical dimension, but we'll take the other two dimensions out like this. It's as if you're looking into the corner of a room. So we could say this is, uh, we'd have to say this is height. We could say this was width, and then we could make this depth. And that would correspond to something we all completely know and completely understand. Now let's do the same thing with my earlier diagram. And the difference is that we flip the corner. And this is how it was originally presented in the book. So this is nothing new. Um, and now you've got goodness, actually, now you've got goodness, truth and chance, say, looking like this. So you're now looking, this is, this whole space becomes subjective by flipping it around, by taking you out of it. This whole space is now is now subjective. So we're describing an interior space that we can apprehend, but we but we are at, in the I, as in I myself, we are outside of this space. Why is that interesting? Well, because coming back to whoops, coming back to the original diagram like this. we suddenly realise that as we are travelling along this dimension of chance and fate, because actually it's moving, we're not moving, I'll have to, <coughs> you'll have to bear with me, some things are, take a bit more explaining, that's, that's one thing that takes a bit more explaining, uh, but you'll see Again, as we go forward over time, you'll see that I'm 100% consistent. This is something that has been said about it um, when there's been the opportunity. Sorry. So, this we're moving forward in this direction, in, in this dimension. But this is a subjective space. This is a, we, we should really be looking at this as if it was the corner, as, as we did a minute ago. If we did that, then we would give ourselves a path which was trying to enter this subjective space. We would we would modify our uh, modify the movement of this path because actually what we want what we need it to do is not is not be outside of these two but we need it to be inside of these two we need to draw it like that not like this and the this uh, path that we're trying to make for ourselves as we go forward and that's why I have to use the word destiny for this path, because I'm not talking about progressing in your job or 
to getting married to getting a degree I'm talking about progressing towards a destiny which is your own internal sense of who you are who you have to be so for a a, a long long time when I was doing the writing doing the videos and quite frankly thinking it through in readiness to do that the whole thing seemed to the whole uh, set of ideas that I was trying to keep together seemed to me to be crazy because nothing to do with me I'm not a physicist I'm not a psychologist I'm aspire to be a philosopher but but realistically not 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 with not with craziness so I was in the situation of um, imagining um, imaginary futures for myself and um, one has an element of sympathy with people in that situation who come to believe these imaginary futures to some extent there's an element of sympathy with people who believe they're going to they deserve they're going to win the lottery because they deserve to it's a it's a very appealing thing to believe in imaginary future because what what's the risk it's true that there's and uh, there's it's true that it's true that you're deferring your reward by believing in an imaginary future but how much better to believe in a real future and if you can't envisage the real future as I couldn't envisage my future then what you need is a strategy which stops you from following these false paths and the thing that the thing that's slightly uh, the thing that, that that struck me so powerfully about this was that from another person's point of view looking at looking at somebody following this path from outside it seems as if this person is going round a bend the person who the person who goes off on their own path kind of seems to be going round a bend from the perspective of somebody going along the straight path in fact they're they're the other way round it's this person going along the straight path who is following a curve the rail the way a railway engine can follow a curve of a track without having any perception of it in the railway carriage whereas the person who pursues their imaginary future is actually doing so on a straight line it's just that it looks bent from from outside and this was the insight really about what the significance is of this subjectiveness because from a perception point of view the danger the, the danger in belief of these false futures is that one constantly is on the verge of some kind of fabulous success you know whether it's getting rich getting famous uh, getting power getting um, getting glory whatever you're you don't perceive the path as been you don't perceive the path as bending left or right you perceive it as bending towards what you most want to be what you most want to have so that is an advantage because it, it gives you motivation but it's a risk because 
you could be fooling yourself. Now, the final the final element of the jigsaw, one is travelled one is one is travelled along this path, whether it's a moving walkway or whether, or whether one walks it oneself. And so one is taking one step after another, and then a lot of time passes on the way forward. So one of the things that one can consciously try and do in order to stay on the best path, the one that is most likely to angle back towards reality and least likely to spin off to some imaginary, embarrassing, unbelievable, ridiculous, self-idea, self one of the best ways to, to avoid that is to be very conscious that at any point on this path there is a vast array of choice and be very conscious that trying to choose between those choices is a very, very powerful corrective to, to these risky behaviours. In other words, regularly remind yourself that you have infinite choice and that therefore there's every reason to consider as many choices as possible and then you may well find that an unexpected choice is or an uh, unobvious choice is by far the best one for you. And it's been interesting to me as I've practiced this philosophy because it's, it's quite a straightforward idea to take on board really. What's, what has been, what has, what I have noticed is that although we say we have infinite choice, in fact so many choices that are possible simply do not occur to you. I mean, there, there, there wouldn't be time to consider infinite choice, but the mind is not actually constructed in such a way that it is able. It, 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 it doesn't want to, it's not able to consider infinite choice. So actually, when you do consider your choices more carefully than you might otherwise, it's not a, it doesn't take a great deal more time. There, there aren't a great deal more choices that, that occur to you. It's quite hard to, 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 to consider um, unusual choices. I wouldn't say that my experience has led me to think it's worth doing either. I'll give just, uh, just one example of, um, of a situation which, which struck me um, in, this, in this area. And that's uh, when I was splitting up with my partner, uh, which is never, never fun. Um, and out of the, completely out of the blue, my partner said to me, you could rent my house. That turned a huge negative into a huge po positive for me and was not something I would ever have considered or ever have suggested. So I was very, very struck by, um, by the open-mindedness, really, that, that, um, that gave rise to that offer. I want to leave it there in this discussion of destiny. Let's redraw this diagram um, in a way that expresses our understanding. So I've still got an objective dimension horizontally. I'm going to dotted line the dimension below that line 
and then have it solid coming up and then I'm going to dotted line this dimension coming up and continue it out here. So this is goodness, this is truth, this is chance. However, let's take that away completely And now it becomes much clearer why we are very, very keen not to go off we're very very keen not to come outside of the box and go off on some kind of tangent of what on some kind of tangent of self-delusion You know, I think I might change that. Finally then, just redrawing that diagram to express more exactly what I was trying to say, less, more objectively, less subjectively. <coughs> so I've redrawn it so that uh, we're looking at the corner of a room, slightly ski whiff, so that it fits my purposes. But the point is that we've got a dimension of truth, a dimension of chance, a dimension of goodness, and we've got what is effectively the danger we're trying to avoid if we don't realize the subjective nature of this, that our future, our destiny, will be on this imaginary path rather than on the real path. And if we're not careful about the choices we make, then we will effectively look to other people, although from our point of view, we're following a straight line because it's a, a subjective point of view, not a trustworthy one. From other people's point of view, we're spinning off they're following the they're, they're following the they're following the path that perhaps they're on because they're they've been given it or because what they want is is mundane or any other any other, any of a million reasons they're following the the correct path we'll say one of the many correct paths and we're not, we're spinning off. We're, from their point of view, we are, we are going, and the colloquial term is round the bend. And how this is useful is not just as a warning, um, as, a, as a cautionary uh, reason for us to, to adopt this approach of reviewing the, the choices that we've got um, on, a, on a periodic and um, rigorous basis. Um, it's, it's not just that. The other aspect of this is what you might call the underlying thinking throughout uh, the work that I've done, which is the catch-22 of mental illness. So at the moment, as you may well know, what we have is fundamentally a chemistry-based model of treatment for mental illness i.e. medication, i.e. a physiological basis. There is, there is a, uh, uh, an embryonic, um, an embryonic
cognitive basis um, uh, through through so-called talking cures and various models of 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 behaviour based um, therapy. What I'm suggesting is that. My approach would take us all the way down that path because my approach would literally be catch 22. You may remember the famous, the famous statement that if you're mad enough to want to leave, you're sane because that's what sane people do. There's actually, a, <clears throat> I, I apply a catch 22 to all mental illness, which is that there is an element of um, selfishness, of of uh, selfhood in in that in that mental illness, and so the reason why people need to know and understand a theory of mind, a theory of soul, a theory of philosophy, is so that they can talk about their own mental risks and understand them for themselves because the the, the problem of catch-22 is also the solution of catch-22 which is that you you cure yourself you don't um, you don't use catch-22 to avoid the war you don't have the war in the first place or you stop the war you you become a conscientious project objector you do something real about it and that is that is really a viable uh, approach to the um, to the subject of psychology as a whole and a viable solution to the problems that psychology has of psychobabble and a, a, a non a non-scientific basis, a non-rigorous basis. Let's come back to let's come back to the third dimension is subjective. Here, the the third dimension was introduced by me as being the diagonal dimension here, the one I've drawn diagonally, and the second dimension of goodness, which clearly is subjective, um, was again named as the second dimension by me. So let's review this, this point about the third dimension being subjective. Let's look at it in terms of um, the external universe. If I was to draw the shape of the universe, it would be like this. It's not so. It's not so elegant drawn freehand, but these are meant to be nested pockets of gravity. So, uh, if we think of the 
strength, if we think of the difference in depth as being the difference in strength of the force of gravity, then this might be a planet, this might be a star, this might be a galaxy, this might be a cluster, and so on and so forth. And these pockets in space are dense in what is fundamentally a two-dimensional surface, a two-dimensional plane. Um, there is no... There, there is no absolute the reason why I think of it like this is that it's a it's a convenient way to combine things on the basis that they're similar so it's just a neat way of encompassing the whole the whole thing in one in one simple in one simple picture whether there's any meaning or value to having these levels of density being nested i no longer think there is i no longer think that there's a, a way to get from here to here by using this understanding in actual fact, there's no benefit to drawing it like this over drawing it to individual pockets and indentations in the plane. So I don't think there's any value in, in, in this, added by this. I just think it's a, it's a simple, it's just a simple way to represent it. And the point is that these are all deformations of the, of the plane. So if you if you deform the plane too much then all that happens is the plane breaks and you get a black hole so when when suggesting that the third dimension is subjective there is really no difficulty in applying that to the physical external universe because the universe does not give you any argument and many people have studied this to, to see if there was a way to give it a, a, an objective third dimension but they haven't succeeded yet and it's becoming um, unnecessary for them to try because there would be there would be too many questions raised by that kind of answer uh, for anybody to answer, to, for anybody to address. So understanding that the third dimension is subjective in the physical universe completely helps us with the idea that the third dimension is subjective in the abstract universe. What I would refer to as mind space rather than mindset. What we will what we will find that i assert and it's such a big assertion i am cautious of of i'm cautious of imposing it on people however what i do think is that although we uh, um, although we are transitioning through space I don't think we're changing our position absolutely so one of the things that I think defines family is that those are the people who you are genuinely next to in space and however far or near you are to them during your lifetime doesn't alter the fact that you you have that relation with them in which is a spatial relation in absolute terms and in 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 fact that will never change 
the only thing you can do is change your point of view. You can't change, you can't move and you can't, you, so, so you can, you can, I don't want to go so far as to say you can't move. Uh, let me let me say that um, rather you you let me say rather freed up from your physical body, you can assume any you, you one would imagine that one can assume any shape one sees fit from super long and thin to super fat and wide to any combination adjustment thereof. However, the base, the, the feet, whatever, however you want to define it, that is a fixed, is a fixed thing that can never, can never change. Hmm. An interesting proposition. After all that, let's remind ourselves why we're here. So, six hour long talks, the first on destiny and truth, the next one to be on mind and space, the third one to be on the soul, reincarnation, heaven, gurus and saints. Fourth one is on the I, as in I myself, and uh, the subject will include hypnosis. And then the fifth one is about the conscience and comes back to truth, whilst discussing stardom of all things. And then the sixth and final one, well, It'll be about IT in, in various forms, since that's actually my, my background, my career, my working life. Format of each talk is slightly different to this one in that we'll be, we'll be a bit more factual at the beginning. We'll still have what I call the guru section where we're talking about applying the theory, hopefully in in, in the first part as well. And then in the second or third part, I will talk about something that has been very important to me in my life. And in this talk today, I'll talk about films. The, the next talk, the next talk, the next, the next talks will cover um, in their subjects, um, things that I've have been important to me throughout my life, comics, um, uh, science fiction, particularly short stories, particularly the morality of of those of those media, uh, books in general, um, television, and um, and computers and computer software. So this time. I'm talking about films because I used films originally to identify the scope of the theory of mind. So applying applying the theory of mind to a to a century of film was I thought the best way to explicate how personality uh, drives destiny. It's important to protect the things you love. <coughs> Sometimes you have to protect those things by walking away from them if you yourself are likely to damage them. Other times, 
other times you do what you need to do to preserve that love. When it comes to films, I, I expressed my love by writing about them and I think that came across to other people. Um, <clears throat> what I have slowly come to um, understand that sounds a bit pompous. How I would put it now is that uh, the films from 1935 to 1945 from Hollywood were the greatest influence on me. I found those to be the most glamorous, idealist, ideal, idealised and attractive of all films ever. Uh, so other decades have much to offer, but they have something different to offer in my view. So there is a very strong sense of a century split up into decades with specific highlights that stand separately in relation to each other. And it's that that I was uh, concerned that I did not lose. And it seemed to me a good idea to stop watching some of the trashy sort of films that I found uh, myself being offered um, through, through, particularly through TV as I got older. So that's what I did. <coughs> um, and gradually I realised other sources. So for instance, I started to rent DVDs from the library, which turned out to have a, 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 a much better selection than, than anticipated and from other sources, not from streaming services um, and not from terrestrial TV, not from recording. Um, I, 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 I was very much short of entertainment in those lean years and benefited particularly from podcasts uh, in that time. So, for me, what, um, wh what I ended up doing was renting a lot of DVDs and in, in ultimately deciding that um, a particular service that offered a list that you could build up over time so that I could watch modern DVDs as well as international DVDs and old DVDs was the best combination which, did, which has actually led me to this point in time where, where my, my love of film is preserved and that is a huge, huge um, positive to, to me. <coughs> and leads me to comment on modern film a little bit. So if we, um, if we want to look at any period in film, what uh, my my theory leads me to leads me to believe is that we should be looking for a quaternity of actors. So I was at some pains to do this um, in the in the years since I finished writing the book, and um, the most obvious candidate for membership in the quaternity was Tom Hanks, um, who who at his peak was as attractive and important an actor as Jimmy Stewart had been back in the period that uh, I'm, I'm referring to in my, in my history of film and in the book. Um, the peers of James Stewart were, and I mean I'm, I'm so familiar with it I can name them off the top of my head, uh, always will be able to. Cary Grant, John Wayne, um, Clark Gable. So for me the assessment is completely natural and unclouded. 
and I ought to be able to, one ought to be able to do that, I thought, in any period of film, um, ideally. So, so in the modern period, Tom Hanks is a clear successor to, to James Stewart, uh, but who is the clear successor to Cary Grant, for example? Who is the clear successor to John Wayne? It was not obvious to me, except with hindsight, but I was quite pleased with the quaternity that I ended up with, which was Tom Hanks, Tom Cruise, Nicolas Cage, John Cusack. The films are not the <clears throat> the film product does not match the film product from that I'm the, that I'm comparing it to. Um, which is unfortunate, but as long as one accepts that change is inevitable, then one can, then one can also accept that there will be highs, there will be lows, so it's not the end of the world. I think Perhaps the most positive thing to draw to people's attention is that the one of the defining successes of of Hollywood films were, was its creation of a firmament of stars which was too bright to um, to be condensed by which I mean you could not imagine a film which contained all four of James Stewart, John Wayne, Clark Gable and Cary Grant you could imagine a film that contained two, but you could not imagine a film that contained three, and certainly not one that contained four. And the, and the biggest stars in his day, Clark Gable, you couldn't even do two of. that it's only really Nicolas Cage, the John Wayne figure, who I think has contributed that level of work to the to the to, to film as a whole. And a lot of people would completely disagree with me. A lot of people would not rate Cage anything like that highly. So it's a contentious suggestion. But that for me is the is the biggest is the it's the biggest um, I know there isn't a film that contains all four of these people, but
but the fact that I can imagine one kind of does it means one of two things either I'm jaded and so I've I've seen because I've been going to films for so long and had the freedom to see the films I wanted to see for so long I'm just jaded and I'm um, I've used up I've used these people up that's one possibility the other possibility is that um, my my knee-jerk reaction is 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 genuinely symptomatic one, f one thing I'd add one thing I'd add There's one thing I'd add before you make up your mind about that. I've got a completely different quaternity. I'm going to write down four names on the board and then I'm going to ask you the same question I asked myself about those four names. The four names are actually let me do it this way. So these are my four names, Denzel Washington, Morgan Freeman, Samuel L. Jackson and Will Smith. And I think that that is a similar quaternity of black masculinity to the earlier quaternity, the top of the range of, of, the, of the Hollywood firmament. What's interesting about that quaternity is that I have no difficulty saying that I cannot imagine a film that will contain all of those people. finding it hard to imagine a film that contains two of them. Possibly Jackson and Freeman. I've left you to work out the type of the other four, but let's do that with this type, with these. Obviously, Not, normally the pack type would be a saint, but I think Jackson's USP is that as a pack type, he offers the opposite of self-righteousness, the absolute polar opposite of self-righteousness. 
So let's archetype him as a sinner. Well, there's more to be said about films. <clears throat> Best film of the last 10 years? For my money, the film I've enjoyed the most has been 2012, which was made in 2009. And this being recorded in 2019, it's just about within the decade. My approach to appreciating film is based on identifying within the 100 years, within the 10 years, and, and, and within, within my memory. So that's why I find it valuable to be able to make a choice about the film, I, my favourite films. <clears throat>